Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm Ellie Knowles from Flow. Um, tell you a little bit about what Flow does. We are friends of the Lower Olentangy Watershed, and we care for the Olentangy River from up north at the Delaware Dam all the way to the confluence with the Scioto River. Um, we have a really active volunteer group we do everything from trash cleanups to invasive species removal. We plant trees. We create and care for pollinator gardens. You'll see us at all sorts of events with our table, sharing information about what we do, educating people. We do stream quality monitoring. Um, and if you visit our website at flowohio.org, you can see the results of this year's uh, stream quality monitoring. Um, we have a little report card. We share results. We have our annual report there that'll give you an overview of all our projects and where we've done them. So I'd like to turn this over to Brian Will, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Ellie. So Leslie Shad is joining us from Evanston, Illinois. Leslie is uh, involved with Natural Habitat Evanston, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her journey working with uh, residents of Evanston and her own volunteerism to create pollinator gardens in her community. Leslie Shad is focused on a uh oh. Brian has frozen sustainable on boards, including the National Wildlife Federation. National Habitat Evanston is an all volunteer effort similar to flow to encourage habitat for nature and for people and to change the culture regarding lawns. Leslie and her husband, Joe Brennan, are working to restore forested wetlands in northwest Indiana. And I met uh, Leslie. She did, was part of a, a webinar I saw last Uh, much more time to tell us about her work in creating pollinator gardens, native gardens in Evanston. With that, I will turn it over to Leslie. If you have questions, folks, please put them in the chat and we'll be watching for them and we can ask them at the end of her presentation. Leslie, it's turning it over to you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to um, share and get this. Hopefully you can see that in a minute and I will um, uh, make this so, so thank you so much, you all, for letting me join you. I really uh, hope I, you treat this as I, I want to learn from you all as uh, more than <laughs> probably more than what I'm presenting to you. You may, uh, yeah, uh, I'm. I was really going to sort of be talking about trying to change the culture of lawns. We're in a um, suburb, basically, of Chicago, an old suburb, but. Um, Still, it's we're we're lawn based, and and the city is pretty uh, clamped on to the the lawn idea, and uh, it's it's always a sort of a challenge. And I just appreciate being able to talk to other communities because um, we're really all in this together. So I'll just go through this. It's about it's about half an hour. Um, I wanted to mention first, you know, what I'm thinking about. Uh, Brian mentioned. Uh, you know, what the journey has been for natural habitat. And I'm happy to talk about that. But I was sort of just thinking that I was uh, talking about, you know, transitioning from um, lawn, basically. So I wanted to just mention, so the typical lawn maintenance involves mowing, fertilizing, water during the growing season, broadleaf herbicide, herbiciding walkways, insecticides for roses and such, uh, blowing leaves and dust away from plants, because otherwise yard companies think you don't believe they've been there. Um, mulching leaves and plant stalks and hauling things away. And so this is my garden. This is uh, buffalo grass, which is native in our area, and um, obviously echinacea and some tall bellflower and such. And people are often asking us, you know, it's just one lawn. What is the big deal? Well, y'all probably know that turf is actually more land use than corn, wheat, and fruit trees combined. Um, according to NASA. And in addition to that, we use, of course, water from a hose. So it's treated water, 30 to 60% of our fresh water supplies go to um, our lawn care. 
We uh, applied chemicals at 10 times the average rate of farmers. We also use equipment that is, whether it's electric or gas, it's uh, plugged into energy and it's as good as the energy source that it comes from. So if it's, um, if it's electric, it still is coming from some kind of power plant that um, hopefully is using renewables, but that's not the case for us in any case. Well, in fact, our, our town does have, we did do a um, aggregation where we're purchasing renewables, but our, in Illinois, generally it's coal. Um, and then they're hearing and vibration damage from uh, lawn equipment. So in addition to that, turf grass, of course, uh, it's a species native to Europe and Asia. It was an emblem of privilege because it required uh, a staff to be able to manage and, and mow turf grass. It's we, we mow it before it can produce seeds, nectar, or pollen. So it really is a, a dead zone, basically. And it, of course, displaces native plants. So thanks for that. That's where we are with that. And I what I care about, of course, is uh, uh, biodiversity, really. And I think we've all, you probably can see my cursor, we've all, uh, many of us anyway, grew up with our windshields spattered with insects. And I can say that now I can drive from Evanston to Toledo, Ohio in July and have two insects splattered on my windshield. It is just a scary situation with the decline of insects. And I think we've all really experienced that. There are, you know, bumblebees are in trouble, monarch butterflies, mayflies, you all know that. And that is, uh, you know, globally uh, repeated as well. But I would say that, you know, these are kind of the bumblebees and monarchs are kind of the charismatic megafauna of the world. There was an article in which they mentioned that a whole insect world might be quietly going missing. We're not even, we don't even know what we're missing in terms of uh, insect decline and biodiversity decline. And this guy in the lower right is, of course, a mayfly in case he's not recognizable. Um, in addition, if you don't care about insects, I bet you guys do. But if you don't care about insects, people often care about birds. And so that often resonates, at least in Evanston. Uh, you know, we have 3 billion fewer birds, 29% have declined since 1970. And the reason we care about caterpillars and birds is because 96% of land birds, that means not ducks and waterfowl, but 96% of land birds eat insects. You can imagine that a, a caterpillar is basically a walking foliage, you know, so it just walks around all the time collecting nutrients and it stays pretty squishy and soft. So it is a really valuable commodity for baby birds. Um, Doug Tallamy, an entomologist from the University of Delaware, mentions, you know, he did research on this and a clutch of five chickadees eat six to nine thousand caterpillars in order to fledge. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about why we care, because I think we all care. But uh, I think, you know, apart from seed germination and pest control, you know, raptors and all that kind of thing, I think we care about birds because they add beauty and music to our ecosystem. They belong here. We've done this to them and they link us to something more wild and familiar, uh, you know, in our in our own backyards. So that's the bad news. The good news is, of course, as you know, that the you know the solutions are simple. It's basically doing less, you know, mowing less often. If you mow every other week, or if you mow every week, mow uh, every other week, you know, using no mow grass. I'm going to talk about these things. Reducing your lawn area with pollinator gardens, or adding, if not a pollinator garden, add a keystone native plant like an oak or a goldenrod to your um, conventional gardens. Uh, leaving leaves no pesticides, dimming lights, and protecting birds from windows. So these are some no mow options. Um, the, this, this does resonate in Evanston, I would say. These, uh, I have to say though, that with no mow uh, options, it's not as if you're gonna necessarily have exactly a turf grass unless you keep mowing. This is a no mow, this is commercial no mow. Um, this is actually from prairienursery.com. Uh, this is, um, they suggest mowing once or twice a year to make it kind of short, but this works uh, sun to shade. It's a non-native. This is a non-native mix of fescues and other things. Um, this is Pennsylvania sedge. Maybe you all know about that, but it is, uh, you can see that it's hairy looking. It's very floppy and lush looking here. This is probably a little bit wet, this plot, but Pennsylvania sedge works sun to shade. It is native to Ohio. I did uh, check that. And it's and like um, these native uh, 
uh, grass, these native, this is carex, this is a sedge. It supports, you know, uh, skipper butterflies and other, other insects. Um, this is buffalo gra grass, which is what I have here. It is native in the Illinois area. It does not seem that it's native in, in Ohio, but in looking at preparing for this, I did see that there are Ohio nurseries that recommend it just because it's well adapted to the ecosystem. Um, so there's that. It, it is basically a high plains grass, but it's only four inches tall. I, and it's a, it's a gray color. It's kind of a, you know, pale gray color. So it's not the same as, as turf grass, but you know, that's okay with me. Uh, this is a neighbor of mine's uh, that she started out with uh, Pachysandra in her garden and obviously has created pollinator gardens. And this is probably May. And this is the same garden in, in um, uh, August, I believe. So, you know, there's diversity there. She cares about birds. So she also has layering, which is important for birds to have, uh, you know, taller trees, mid-level and then herbaceous plants. Um, this is her parkway garden, which was grass, and now it's a woodland area. I um, mentioned some of the options here, you know, that for turf, buffalo grass is in sun, and the sedges can usually take sun to shade. Um, and, you know, there are lots of options for native grass, I, uh, native uh, ground covers, you know, uh, for sun, there's a native sedum, um, sedges for shade, ginger, fern, strawberry, and then there are the mixes. So this is how I did it in terms of how does it work in Evanston. Uh, this is my front yard. I started out with turf grass um, that was there before me. I gathered up cardboard, took off a, a lot of the tape that was on it. When I ran out of tar cardboard, I used newspapers, which you have to make pretty thick because otherwise um, the, your lawn will come back. I laid down all the cardboard and the, you can see this is some of the um, newspaper, put some compost and mulch on top. I seeded it with buffalo grass and cone flowers and I kept it pretty moist. Uh, not a, I didn't spend a lot of time on it. We happened to have a, a pretty wet um, beginning of summer that year, but between um, this is April and this is August. So in, by August, this is buffalo grass and, and it's persisted. I, I would say my anise hyssop is kind of infringed on my area of buffalo grass, but there definitely is, um, nobody has ever complained about it. They only stop and look and I have so many goldfinches there from the in the anise hyssop. Um, so nobody really complains at all about my front yard. I mean, people might be muttering, but they're not saying it to me. Uh, <laughs> So uh, many of us, when we're thinking about a pollinator garden, the thing that pops to mind is um, plants that produce nectar, pollen, seeds, and berries, and pretty much do it all year round. And that's really important and great. And I, um, I'm glad that we're doing that. And I think, you know, uh, especially seeds, berries, and nuts across seasons is incredibly important for our birds. Uh, but I also want to call out host plants because sometimes we're not as familiar with host plants. And uh, host plants are basically 90% uh, of bugs that eat plants uh, rely on a family, a narrow family of uh, plants. What basically has happened is just like the monarch has evolved with uh, the milkweed, they rely on each other. Without milkweed, you don't get uh, monarchs. And monarchs have actually uh, evolved to have an enzyme that allows them to digest milkweed that they might not otherwise be able to do. Well, they wouldn't be able to do. Um, so this is true not only of uh, monarch butterflies, of course, but it's true of uh, many, most plant eating insects, which means bumblebees eat pollen, you know, and nectar, uh, but they are eating, they're a plant eating insect. So are uh, beetles and ants and thrips and uh, leaf hoppers and, and butterflies and moths. So this is a uh, guide from the uh, Field Museum in Chicago, and it compares local uh, butterflies at, to and mentions their host plants. So this is very hard to read. I know I apologize about that. But for example, the violet fritillary is a common butterfly that relies on violets. Pearl crescent, I'm going to have a photo of the fritillary later. Pearl crescents are rely on asters, any kind of aster, eastern comma, elms and nettles. I'm going to show you some nettles that, that are probably something you would otherwise be pulling in your yard. 
uh, red admirals rely on uh, nettles. And without, you know, it, when we lose these native plants, we lose these uh, this crit, these critters as well. And besides that, you know, the the web of interrelationships is so complicated that you can also, you know, you can lose uh, an insect and then also lose the uh, bugs that predate upon him, you know, so you, uh, there's there are a lot of interrelationships in, in this. And so that's why we need, a, you know, diverse natives in our garden. So a solution is to just add keystone plants. You may all know, but, you know, the most important native plant in North America are oaks. They support, these are Illinois numbers. Nationally, oaks support 530 species of caterpillar. This is, again, this is uh, Doug Tallamy, who I mentioned from the University of Delaware. He has uh, prioritized and ranked uh, plants by the number of caterpillar species they support. And you'd say, you know, well, why, why caterpillars in particular? Well, if you think about caterpillars, caterpillars support uh, what rely, what eats caterpillars. Everything eats caterpillars. Uh, you know, spiders, other insects, uh, birds, chipmunks, possums. Everything eats. So it really supports a, a web of uh, biodiversity. And um, uh, oaks, for example, 456 species in Illinois rely on rely on oaks. Cherries are next. Willows and birches are, are top of the list in terms of uh, keystone plants that really support biodiversity. Um, wildflowers among the herbaceous plants. It's uh, actually native clover. I didn't list that because we don't. It's not you don't see that so often. There's purple prairie clover, but that's a different uh, plant than uh, the. Uh, triflorum, I think it's color. I can't remember the, the Latin name of it, but um, there's a clover up here, but then also goldenrods and asters are top of the list, supporting more than 100 species of, of caterpillars. And then I've just done a, you know, taken a little snapshot of some common native plants to, to show you, um, you know, uh, the how many species are reliant on these common plants and i just love this little caterpillar up here because it's just so wild looking and it happened to be on my glove and it's a morning glory prominent and i just thought it was cool so put them in there these are the nettles that are non-stinging nettles uh they are very common and probably pulled quickly in when they crop up because people would be like well i don't know what that is and you know why do i want that in my yard and I would say this, these are photos from my backyard when they were, um, this is probably June. And this does, this Pennsylvania Pellatory does get to be two feet tall and have unnoticeable yellow flowers along its stem. Um, so it gets to be kind of biggish. Uh, but these are nettles that don't sting anybody and they support you know, they're host plants to butterflies that we otherwise uh, miss out on. So um, so anyway, I keep them. I let them just do their thing in my yard. And I do have some resources here of um, both native plant layouts. The U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture also has native plant layouts. And then, uh, you know, just sort of descriptions of helping you uh you know, design a garden that is, you know, low in front, taller in back, uh, you know, diverse colors and, and seasons um, represented. And then search functions for for um, you all, if you are interested, you can plug in your zip code into this National Wildlife Federation uh, database, which Doug Tallamy helped create. And you'll see by plant how many species in your zip code, how many caterpillar species in your zip code are supported by individual plants. So that's just um, interesting. I wanted to, you know, when I'm thinking about converting to uh, more natural gardening, I want to call out leaving the leaves. Uh, again, something y'all are probably aware of, but I wanted to focus on who loses if we are not leaving our leaves. Uh, many people know, you know, that monarchs uh, migrate down to Mexico, which is, you know, presents its own problems for the monarch, but it's unusual. It's uh, where we sort of call it out because it's it's not the way most of our insects behave. Most of our insects live where they where we see them in our yard. Basically, they're in our backyards throughout the winter time. Um, the the lady the ladybug beetle, the ladybug, um, basically you know lives all the time in our in our backyard. This is a larva of a ladybug. In case you didn't know about them, what they look like. This is a woolly bear of moth. We all, well, woolly bear caterpillar. We all maybe know about that. This is the Isabella moth it turns into, but this guy is um, in diapause. He's basically just uh, 
you know, his uh, metabolism just is depressed and quiet. And he just is, uh, you know, lying in our, his, uh, he develops gl glycerol and, and kind of basically antifreeze in his body and, and overwinters in our backyards. These are glow worms, you know, fireflies spend about two years. Well, it depends by species, but many fireflies spend two years in our um, underground in the topsoil and only six weeks flying in our yards. Um, more of these bugs. This is a jumping spider, which is adorable, just to say in that. Uh, <laughs> bumblebees. Bumblebees live in, um, you know, rodent holes and the queen will overwinter. And then when she can start to fly, she'll repopulate the colony. Uh, mining bees burrow into the uh, topsoil as well and don't sting. And I want to mention, you know, plant stalks and seed heads. I mean, you know, there's no way that we wouldn't throw this out. If Would we realize this is a chrysalis of like one of the most fantastic moths in North America? Probably not. It's a luna moth chrysalis and it just looks like leaves. Same, same deal with the poor little giant swallowtail over here. He just looks like leaves. And this is our native mantis. This is the Carolina mantis. And it's their uh, egg sac is just a little bit of an enlargement on the um, on the plant stalks, basically. It's not something we'd necessarily notice. So the whole idea of, oh, well, I'm just going to be real careful when I throw out the plant stalks, that's pretty hard to do. If people do want to uh, remove plant stalks, what I just tell people is, okay, well, break them off, because if you break them, you're less likely to cut right through something, and put it in uh, some dry area of your yard underneath the uh, shrubs or trees or something like that and let it just stay there in in some unobtrusive place. I should mention on the um, leaving the leaves, I mean, leaves will, if they're on turf grass, they will kill turf grass. So what I, I'm not saying you just leave leaves wherever they fall, um, you know, sweep them off walkways and sweep them into uh, pollinator gardens or under trees and shrubs. And there they are the way that uh, trees uh, create topsoil and and fertilize the ground basically. So the nutrients are passed for the uh, through the winter through leaves and and we need them in our um, uh, topsoil. This is a Chinese uh, egg sac and I just want to call it out because um, you know the typically they're sold by integrated pest management companies trying to do something organic. But these uh, you know non-native insects that are brought into our garden as pest control they are uh, you know make it hard for this little Carolina mantis survive. They're pretty um, much bigger and very uh, aggressive. So um, more guys who are affected by uh, plant stalks and who, who overwinter in plant stalks and seed heads. Uh, this is the tawny emperor. I have down here what their larval plants are. So the tawny emperor relies on hackberry. Um, and basically what will happen is they'll curl up inside of a leaf and it will be like five or 10 of the caterpillars in this and they'll just uh, overwinter in there. Um, the viceroy caterpillar has a lot of different um, host plants from cottonwoods to plums, um, but it also, it just kind of sews up a little leaf and crawls inside and overwinters a uh, habernacula. Um, and then, of course, many people know these uh, galls, you know, of course, inside of a gall is a little egg was laid and um, probably a woodpecker pretty soon is going to go pull out that little <laughs> uh, larva that'll be in there. But um, they overwinter, these gall flies overwinter in there. And I would say this, so this goldenrod, when I was looking at the um, goldenrod gall fly, I was looking at, okay, well, what's its host plant? So its host plant is kind of these tall goldenrods. There are goldenrods that are not tall, crazy goldenrods. So I'm, I'm, you know, you can have goldenrods that are zigzag elm, uh, blue stem goldenrods that are all native, very nice looking goldenrods. Um, and uh, many people also say to me, you know, uh, how long do I have to leave the leaves? You know, it's March and, or, you know, or it's, you know, December, am I done now? And uh, so the answer, I, uh, the, you know, have to bite the bullet. And I, I, I would say I started off saying, you know, well, May, a lot of insects start to fly in May. Well, I'm done with that. You know what? 
we need the leaves to stay. They need to be uh, nutrients for the plants and the trees. And in addition to that, you have bugs like the banded hair streak. Um, I did check that this guy is in Ohio. So uh, these insects are in Ohio. They overwinter as eggs. Some, some butterflies, you know, overwinter as caterpillars or adults, but these guys overwinter as eggs. So if you think about that, they're laying their eggs on their host plants in the fall. They, they will emerge after warm weather starts. So that's got to already be April at the early, you know, that we're talking about. And then weeks later, they emerge as caterpillar. And then by the time they're flying, it could easily be June. So I'm just mentioning that for those guys. Um, these ones overwinter as caterpillars. These. Uh, uh, these ones, these folks overwinter as caterpillars. So this is the Baltimore checker spot. And basically what it'll do is burrow down at the base of its host plant. Here's a white um, turtle head with a bumblebee on it, but a white turtle head and will emerge um, when it can, you know, basically it'll emerge as a, a caterpillar and find its chrysalis and then um, ultimately become a butterfly. But that again can easily be May May or June. Um, this is the violet fritillary. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is its caterpillar and it burrows down at the base of violets to overwinter. And then some uh, insects, some butterflies actually overwinter as adults, just like the, I think, the spider I get mentioned, I think, that has glycerol in its uh, blood and it basically has antifreeze that allow it to overwinter. This is the um, uh, question mark butterfly. You can see it's got like kind of like a parenthesis and a dot. That's the question mark butterfly compared to the comma butterfly. This is, um, I just thought I'd, I think these are interesting. So I'm just sharing them. Um, morning cloak is one of the earliest to emerge as a, uh, as a uh, butterfly and um, it's overwintering as an adult, but it'll pop out. And these are all the host plants of this. I mean, I'll just spit, speed through a little bit of that. Um, I mentioned, you know, in terms of native um, planting, of course, one of the benefits is that you, you know, don't have to water as much. It has these plants have deep roots and and they survive drought better. Some of them are uh, rain garden plants, and and uh, some of the native plants are rain garden plants, and they do absorb a lot of water. Uh, but one of the things is you don't really need to use chemical fertilizers, and we hope they will uh, be allowed to um, encourage insects where the um, insects self-regulate, sort of recreate a natural balance where you have predators that are holding other um, insects in balance in your garden. But the most common pesticide in the United States is our neonicotinoids. Uh, they are a, um, the most common brands are ortho and Bayer. They are um, systemic pesticides. So nurseries often will spray it on the soil uh, before shipping plants out. Uh, the um, When it's sprayed on the soil and gets into the roots, it will make the entire plant toxic so that the pollen, the seeds, everything is in a, becomes toxic. Uh, in addition to that, there are studies of the um, uh, how long this persists and the Xerxes Society, which is a, a, a basically a bug nonprofit, they um, have studied... Um, rhododendrons that where the pesticide uh, neonicotinoids persisted for six years. So it's it makes the whole plant non, uh, toxic and it persists. Uh, the American Bird Conservancy says that a single tree seed treated with neonicotinoids uh, can kill a song sparrow. And, um, you know, the other thing is that this is so pervasive, the use of these pesticides, that nurseries don't even think about it. I, in the Evanston area, I called around to 30, 30 different nurseries, uh, asking them if they use neonicotinoids. The native nurseries did not. But any nursery that sold native ours or cultivars, uh, they could not say that they didn't uh, treat their plants with neonicotinoids. A lot of the time they are um, getting plants from growers and the growers will routinely spray. So it's just something to be aware of and, and you know counterproductive to what we're trying to do. 
Um, I'm going to just do briefly something on lighting because uh, this is the problem, of course. You know, bright white lights uh, attract enormous volume of insects that are easily predated and over predated. And the, um, there are, is research showing that this is actually contributed to insect decline because, you know, spiders and bats and birds all hang out here. And you think, oh, well, that's good for spiders and bats and birds. Yeah, but we, we are creating an artificial hunting um, situation where where uh, we're undermining our ecosystem. So the answer is to use light if, when, and where we need it, keep it orange, red, and min minimized, and brighter isn't safer. So I'm going to say a tiny bit about that. This is accent lighting. You know, what we need to start moving toward is, is using the light shaded where we need it. Um, turn off unnecessary lights by uh, 11 p.m. in migration. This is these are the same house. You can see that this is the hill right here. There's the hill right there. So uh, here you can obviously see the Milky Way. Um, you uh, solutions, you know, shades, dimmers, motion sensors. If instead of a lighted path, use your uh, cell phone. Amber red, the deal with amber red is that birds need amber light, but fireflies are actually operate on the amber spectrum. Uh, fireflies, what will happen is that female fireflies stop flashing if uh, lights, amber lights are around them because they just don't compete. And so for fireflies, they actually need red lights, but, uh, um, you know, really off off amber lights. So, I mean, a solution is really, do we need night lighting everywhere? Or can we use motion sensors instead? I mean, there, there must be some, some solution to that. I do have some red lights at my um, country house, uh, but we turn them off at, at 11 o'clock, um, if not before. Anyway, and la aiming light where you need it. Um, this I mentioned brighter isn't safer. So this is obviously a photo depiction of this. So I'm not saying, you know, I'll, I'll say out loud, your results may differ, but I think that if you should test out, if you have a glaring bright light, how well do your eyes adjust to the dark? This is just demonstrating that, you know, shading a bright light, you actually can see into the dark more clearly because you're uh, on the safety issue, your eyes are slower to adjust. And, you know, there is a whole dark skies movement because of um, human effects from um, never turning off the lights, as well as all these effects on wildlife, you know, navigating a, and communicating and hiding. And there are studies about fox squirrels that are declining in, in population because they're hunting longer and then they're predated longer in the evenings. Um, it also, birds are affected by bright lights. You know, the in bad weather, migratory birds come lower to the ground and are, have higher levels of uh, bird strikes against windows. Um, these are solutions to windows. Uh, this is actually a, a, from a YouTube video, the guy showing how you use a ceramic uh, white pen to make lines on your window, and you have to do it on the outside to interrupt the um, uh, reflection here. Um, but I have this on my um, kitchen window, actually, and it's worked really well. And this is just to demonstrate that it is very easy to see out. It's not as if your vision out is obscured. Um, but ways, you know, well, sometimes I think about, you know, well, okay, I'm doing this in my home, but how can I have a bigger impact? Well, some of the things to do is if you have a club, place of worship, apartment, um, some school, something like that, you know, at, suggest that they do one thing, you know, mow less often, leave their leaves, or add a keystone plant, maybe add an oak would be great. Um, same thing with asking nurseries, for example, ask your nursery, uh, native nursery, you know, what do they do about neonicotinoids? Very likely they don't even really know about them or haven't even thought about it too much. Sometimes native nurseries might, but, um, or even just asking na about natives at a, at a conventional nursery and see if they, you know, um, I think they're just asking the questions, make them think about it. If you have an, uh, company where you work or, or an apartment building where you live, ask janitorial staff where do birds hit, you know, um, th that itself can start people thinking about what windows might need fixing or some kind of marking on the outside. It is, as mentioned, super, this, this pen costs about $9. Um, also, there also were films and other solutions. And then, you know, joining, hosting, or supporting a plant sale, all the things that a flow is already doing, actually. Just doing what, you know, supporting flow is, is an, another big step. 
Um, these are uh, different pledges that we've taken, you know, trying to incur or initiated to try to encourage different um, good behaviors. And then I have my resources here, a list that I could share out, and that's the end of me. Um, I really appreciate your your time and your uh, allowing me to come talk with you all. Do we have any questions? Looks like there are some questions in the chat. Ellie, um, one question was about jumping worms and if you've had any experience with those, Leslie. We do, we do have jumping worms. I, in my yard, I definitely have jumping worms. Uh, we, um, uh, there are areas of Evanston where people think they don't have jumping worms. I really bet they have jumping worms, but I'm thrilled if they don't. So uh, we do, um, I don't stop people from um, trading plants, but I en uh, encourage everyone to do bare root plants. So basically we have a bucket and you kind of wash out the, the roots to try to get rid of any um, jumping worms or egg sacs that are in there. And instead of just handing people uh, probably a pile of jumping worms. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk to somebody if they have more specific questions. I don't know if that was what... Um, we definitely have, have them, and I think they're everywhere. <laughs> and actually, I th would think that Ohio is even, I think it came from the East. So I would think you guys have even a worse problem. But I think we're, we're done. I think we're done. I think we've got it everywhere, really. Yeah, we have them. We have them. Yeah. I mean, so what it has I been think the. You're right. Maybe, maybe because people are not native. I missed that. I, I'm sorry. But what, what are jumping worms? Oh, sorry. So jumping worms. So first of all, earthworms are not native to, <laughs> to North America. They're basically, they are from other places, but jumping worms, uh, they are a pretty large gray worm that has a very pronounced uh, band on it. Um, and when you touch or disturb them, they will go, <laughs> basically, <laughs> except without the noise, as far as I'm aware. Um, and they flip all over. And, and so the problem with them is that they, um, they stay in the upper part of the topsoil and they um, are very efficient at breaking down um, mulch and leaves and things like that, which you think would be good, but it apparently, especially in forest ecosystems, can make it very hard for plants to establish. They just, their roots do not um, have enough to, to hang on to. It breaks down the soil structure, basically. So, um, so that's the problem with jumping worms. I mean, to be honest, in Evanston, we do have some forests here and we are are worried about what's going to happen to them. We think it's not so bad in those forests, to be honest. But um, in your backyard, I really don't notice much, to be honest. I mean, I, that's, I was just going to ask, um, you know, Ellie, what she thought about that, because uh, I, I, you know, I haven't noticed really bad effects, but I'm expecting them in forested areas. I found them in, in the woods near me, which is probably why I have them in my yard. Right. So... Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree that the um, bare sharing plants by bare root is a help, but I've heard a lot of reports that people find it in their mulch. Oh, right. The compost that they buy in the bags. Right. Well, and also our landscape guy said, you're not, I don't have a landscape guy. There's a, one of our partners that we try that is trying to help you know encourage native planting he said he thinks he's you know bringing it around throughout the whole city every single time one of his crew is is going around the streets you know the landscape crews for sure i mean you know just the clods of their shoes are probably bringing around you know jumping worms everywhere um so so there's that had a question about sedge and planting it from seed. Is that possible, particularly when you're trying to be economically wise? Huh. Well, so, I mean, um, I, you know, I haven't found that Pennsylvania sedge worked very well from seed. And I haven't gotten a prairie drop seed going from seed yet although I'm still hopeful about that. So I think it's a little bit hard. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I agree with you absolutely on economic being economic and I've, I've been doing that too. Buffalo grass for sure works from seed, although not native um, specifically in Ohio. Um, but 
Yeah, I don't know. What's been your experience about that? I, I've had it, I found it kind of hard to get uh, Carex going from seed. I yeah, know. I don't have any experience with that yeah. myself. Um, how about buffalo grass and being safe for children? It's a question about uh, buffalo grass and being safe for children. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. As, I think as a play area, <laughs> like, yeah, as okay. a play area. It's totally fine. I mean, I, okay, now, now you're going to make me Google whether there's some kind of crazy toxicity or attack mechanism that it has, but I don't think it does. I have it in my yard. It's very, it's low growing. It's basically six inches. I think Adam was meaning, you know, okay, it's low growing. So it's not like it's so tall that kids are going to trip on it. It's like six inches tall. And, okay. and uh, it, um, I mean, it does have runners. It does have little runners in it, but they break immediately. I mean, I, I possibly a toddler could trip over, but uh, you know, is it, is it safe for, um, kid, I mean, in terms of like, will it last with kids are running on it? Will it be, or where, where, well, I don't think quickly? any grass really, uh, honestly, you know, if, if there's a, if it's a real big traffic area in my backyard, it's my dogs running straight back and forth on the same path all the time. Okay. And, you know, uh, I mean, it, it persists, but it, you know, it's thinner where there's a lot of traffic. And I think that's kind of typical of any kind of grass, to be honest. So I, I probably have some tolerance to that, um, except for, I think, uh, Creeping Charlie just seems absolutely indestructible. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's uh, another alternative. The, the pen that you mentioned, Leslie, what kind of pen was used to draw the lines? Yeah. For check so birds? Yeah, so it's a, a ceramic pen um, from Dick Blick, I think. I didn't oh. bring it with me, um, but I can, um, I think I can look up the, uh, uh, while we're talking about something else, I'll look for the um, actual name of it. Um, it's like a Pebo, P-E-B-E-O is one of them, but really, I think, honestly, any, um, you know, ceramic uh, line and not, I'd say not the thinnest possible. If you make it really fine, the birds might miss it, but just, a, you know, a medium, medium fine uh, ceramic point for, for, and white is better and vertical lines apparently are better, two inches apart. So. Um, does that persist or does it come off every time you wash your windows? No, it, it, well, no, I mean, um, I've had it for about four years on one window. It doesn't seem to be in any way of, you know, falling off. You can easily scratch it off with a fingernail or a credit card or something, a sharp edge. Um, but it doesn't, and so you can also clean things up. If you make a smudge or something, you can, you know, take it off and clean it up. But it it seems to last very well, actually. I mean, that's really the advantage of it. You can do, uh, you know, other treatments to try to um, make windows visible. You know, you can use tempera paint and you can use soap and you can use, um, even there are, um, uh, um, hmm, I can't say the word. Uh, the, there are paints that are in sticks. Um, I can't say the word. But anyway, um, uh, so you know there are different um, there there are different options, but these do last and they're fairly neat looking. So um, yeah, I, I, I'd recommend. Yeah, that. The yeah other I've used that. I've used strings. Yeah, well, squirrels, I have the squirrels like, like to chew them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they don't last very long. Oh, okay. I use the copian blinds. I have the, had them up for a long time. Those are like the strings on the front of your window. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, yeah, it all worked. It's worked okay for me. Okay. And it does have to be on the outside of your glass, grass, glass. So if it's a second floor or something like that, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to access and draw the lines on the um, outside of your glass higher up. And that's where I felt like the acopian blinds or the, the, you know, the strings does work better. Or um, I've, there also are, you know, dots that come in sheets that you can unroll, but that's also hard to do if you're, if you're doing it hanging out of a window. Um, so we had a question. Um about suggestions for getting started in areas where neighbors or city officials may not be as accepting of non-turf lawns. Right. Any recommendations? I mean, so yeah, we were talking a little bit about this. I mean, first of all, a non-turf lawn is um, something that, you know, 
I think, you know, it won't look exactly like a turf lawn unless you're mowing it. So, um, you know, but honestly, if you did, I think the one that is probably the um, most like just uh, bluegrass or, or, you know, commercial turf grasses is, is, are the no mow um, options because they're the same color. They look kind of similar. And if you um, mowed it twice a year or something, I think, you know. <sighs> depends on if you have a ton of water if it you know the length of your grass kind of is uh directly corresponds to how much rain you're getting if you get a lot of rain you might get tall grass and need to mow it more often but honestly i think if you do a no mow grass that you don't have to that doesn't grow as fast as um you know some of the other uh turf grasses and then you mow it once or twice i mean that's that's pretty uh acceptable I, i'd say i i do think though that there are a lot of kind of you know, it's the intentionality of the of the garden is really critical. If you um, uh, you know have a low growing uh, ground cover around the outside edge of your garden, and you um, group the same species together so that you have big areas of the same type of plant, and then uh, you also have your eye attracted to something either by a path or a um, some destination point like a bird bath or rocks or something like that. It makes it all look more intentional. So there are lots of things that landscapers do to make gardens look nice. And we just, you know, especially in areas where people are watching us, we just have to do that. And a sign saying, saying you know, that you have a, you know, a pollinator garden in progress, I think is, uh, makes people a lot more um, patient with you. But, um, I did have a request to see that resource page again. Sure. Sure. The resource pages. I think you had two pages. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, um, oh, I have the rusty patch here. You don't care about that. But um, yeah, the field museum guides are here. You know, I mean, um, if there's, I'm happy to share these out. The wildlife values I just have uh, on a Google doc, basically. Um, Audubon's plant for birds is a, is a really good um, resource that you can, uh, you know, search through. Um, Possibility Place, Shady Grove. Uh, oh, th these, are, um, these are other places that allow you to search for plants. Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery. Um, let's see. And then these are about neonicotinoids. Uh, these are the, this is the list of brands that um, uh, sell our neonicotinoids, the Center for Food Safety. If you search for neonics, you can say neo, N-E-O-N-I-C-S. Neonics should, should pop these up. Um, and then bird collisions. These are all different. You know, there are a lot of YouTube channels on the ceramic pens and, and tempera paint. That's what I, I was missing the word for tempera. That was pathetic. Um, tempera paint and, and then all using tape on the outside of your um, glass or strings that I mentioned, birdsavers.com is what I used. A question about with climate change, how that will impact the types of plants that could be put into a native garden. Yeah. So that's yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, that, uh, huh. well, I mean, I, it's it's hard to know what's going to happen with climate change and how bad it's going to be, how fast. And, um, you know, uh, you know, the the advantage from native plants is that for the most part, they have deep roots. They are um, evolved with other local plants and insects. And, you know, I mean, I, I would say, you know, that. Uh, I mean, I'm what I'm doing. I mean, I, what we're doing in Evanston, though, is to look at um, more southern plants, more native plants, but looking at, um, you know, down a zone or two and, and the city even is planting more bald cypress and, and things that are really kind of more southern plants. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think it's, I, you know, I think the diversity just seems to me to be, you know, the the thing to do, I, but I'm open to what you all think. I mean, you know, that's that's kind of a question for the group too. I mean, uh, you know, what are you all doing when you choose your your trees? That you're we're planting a lot of trees too, but we tend to plant um, local, you know, uh, native trees. I am worried also though about diseases coming in where there is oak wilt not too far from us in Northwest Indiana and, um, you know, more diseases coming through is, is probably a likelihood. 
Yeah, I heard that uh, some maples too will be impacted uh, in moving further north uh, mm -hmm. than than like. Mm -hmm. Central Ohio, the gradually last oaks uh, prefer a little bit drier soil, and because of these heavy downpours, we've been having more and more climate change that it could impact uh, over the long term uh, the health of oaks, which is scary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just seems like we just do need diversity. <laughs> you know, be planting hickories, be planting, you know, and, uh, all sorts of different, you know, species. Good advice. Well, we're running out of time. I um, want to thank everybody for their excellent questions and Leslie for participating today. Wow, what a fantastic presentation and a great turnout for us. Uh, I'll turn it over to Ellie and let her wrap up. Okay, well, were there any more questions? I don't think I see any more in the chat. I have a, I have a question. Okay. Dave? Yeah. So Leslie, when you uh, was that topsoil that you put down on top of your cardboard? It was compost and mulch is what okay. I leaf mulch. I had leaf mulch and and uh, the city uh, just you know chews up all of its uh, trees and things and and we can go access leaf mulch for free. Okay. And then did you um did you plant seed directly into that? I did, and I just raked it in. And then those plants, they, um, you know, did, did they germinate pretty well? And did the, the it, I, I would be concerned that the, the cardboard didn't form a barrier to the roots or anything like that. I didn't have any problem by the time oh, okay. the seed, uh, no, the seed germinated. In fact, I even took some um, small plugs and kind of splayed them, spl you know, like pulled them apart a little bit yeah. so that they were only maybe you know, two inches, but spread out and they stayed in the ground and they did fine. I really mm -hmm. had the, the only issues that I had is there were um, some areas where I uh, didn't, I had newspaper, it wasn't thick enough. And I had some, um, you know, uh, turf grass come back up. Um, so turf grass hasn't really been an issue with coming back up. What's been the issue is keeping track of all the creeping Charlie. You oh, know, okay. Charlie is just like irrepressible and it just comes in from whatever. I think it comes in from nurseries too, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, no, it actually really did work. And, and, uh, the, I, I think the, the trick on it is, is, um, having it be moist enough that the cardboard actually deteriorates. If it's really dry, it won't deteriorate. Right. So, <laughs> was there like a lag time before you put the seed down? Like, like you put nope. down your cardboard and your mulch and then, oh, really? Okay. It was like within 48 hours. I mean, I had my oh, son yeah. and my husband with me for like 48 hours. So it was oh. like, it was all going to get done uh -huh. <laughs> in that time frame. And so that's what we did. And and uh, no, it actually really, really did work. Yeah. Oh, cool. But you can, you know, Google cardboard lasagna. Cardboard. Oh, no, I've, you know, and, I've, I've, I've heard of it. But I've kind of like always had this specific question, you know, like, does yeah. it form a, a barrier to the roots? And like, can the, the wildflower seed like, you know, establish right on top of it? And I just, I hadn't heard someone, you know, I, yeah. I wanted to hear from someone who'd done it. Well, I was just thinking that maybe, you know, online people are like, oh, this didn't work at all. But it, for me, it totally worked. And I would say I didn't, uh, it would probably not work if you were trying to really plant deep plugs. I tried to try to not break up the uh, cardboard for sure. Okay. I you know, see. Because then it just makes a hole that I think everything would just come up because it wanted to, it wanted to come up. I mean, the other way of doing it is, um, you know, black plastic, except I just didn't want to have plastic in them. Ah, yeah deal with it but and then you have to remove the plastic is the other thing so mm -hmm. i don't want to bother with that but yeah that's cool yeah. i see another question um are there resources for where to get plants without neonicotinoids uh you know i think it just takes asking i you know i have not found any um any you know i there what basically happens is there are um you know, native nurseries that I just, uh, one of them, I honestly, I sort of don't believe that they don't use me. And so I ask them every year and they say, mm. no, we're not using, but <laughs> for the most part, the, you know, reliable, you know, nurse nurseries, I mean, you know, uh, 
I mean, we have a few that we, that, you know, everyone uses because they are reliable about this and they totally believe it. You can often find a neonicotinoid statement on a nursery website, um, Prairie Moon, Prairie Nursery Habit. Those are, those are closer to me. They're, you know, mid uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, but, um, you know, I, I looked online, there was Ohio native plants. Um, th that must be, uh, it seems like a big nursery near you all. And, um, but yeah, I, I would think, you know, Google for a neonic statement on there. I don't know. I, I don't have a solution for that. You just have to ask. Yeah. I've, I've found that nurseries often don't know. Yeah. Because they are sourcing from multiple locations and they say, well, you have to call the grower. Yeah. But of if course- you even think, know what you're talking about. Right. And that to me is just like a flashing warning sign, mm -hmm. honestly. If they, if they don't know, I don't trust it, you know? But, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is there are other, there are people who do care about this, you know? And so I think that they ought to benefit from our business, you know? So if they're losing our business because they're not checking into it, I mean, I think they should know that, you know, I can't, sh I, I, I have the benefit of being able to say, you know, um, I really value what you're doing and whatever, you know, you can do about selling native plants, but I'm natural habitat and I have to, you know, support people who are really uh, being careful about neonics. So, you know, I, I know that sounds holier than thou, but you know what? We're a market, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I think that's it for questions.